our next speaker is going to be Professor John Welch, um, uh, who's here at Brigham Young University, and for a complete uh, biography of uh, Professor Welch uh, in the program, you can you can find that on page ten. So, uh, without further ado, turn the time over to Professor Welch. Thank you, thank you Jacob, and, <clears throat> and thank you all for being here. I'm excited to speak, and of course, very excited about this whole. Uh, day and wonderful jubilee occasion. <clears throat> and yes, I did wake up at 4.30 this morning. <laughs> My topic today is narrating homicide chiastically. The truth be known, murder is an ugly, awful subject. <clears throat> Even when packaged in beautiful, crafted literature, first-degree homicide <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> For <coughs> wow, we're going to start over. <coughs> Sorry about that. The truth be known, <coughs> murder is an ugly, awful subject. Even when packaged in beautifully crafted literature. First-degree homicide is to be universally assailed as awful and terrible. Murder is disruptive to the very fabric of human life. <clears throat> it instills in the community fear, chaos, vengeance, and blood feuds. It throws the normal boundaries of human powers in the world into personal turmoil, metaphysical uncertainty, and cosmic imbalance. The groundbreaking legal historian F.W. Maitland <clears throat> once famously said, if I want to know the basic values of any tribe or social group, the first thing I ask is, can you show me a case of homicide and how it is handled? I can learn more about, watching, about a society by watching a homicide trial than by any other way. And I would agree, but with one elaboration. I would add, and show me a homicide narrative in a sacred text, and we can know more about the laws, social beliefs, and ultimate values of its adherents than by any other way. <clears throat> Many homicide stories and laws are found in the scriptures. <clears throat> in the forthcoming volume of the Jewish Law Association Studies, which contains papers from a meeting in Antwerp on Jewish law and narrative, I discussed 23 homicide narratives in the Bible and 17 in the Book of Mormon. Those 40 stories are factually entangled and legally complicated. In addition, much has been written about the laws of homicide and refuge in the Hebrew Bible and about the process of extracting legal material from biblical narratives. As Asnat Bartar has recently stated, the biblical texts, in the biblical texts, the narrative and, and the laws are not only combined together, as sometimes <clears throat> they are actually merged. <clears throat> Among many interesting findings, one of my observations in that forthcoming article is that chiasmus is used both in the genre of law codes and also in the genre of legal narratives regarding homicide. Chiasmus does not appear in all such texts, but it is significantly used in several homicide accounts. While many scholars have analyzed legal aspects of these homicide narratives in isolation, no one has tackled the, the chore of synthesizing and then analyzing all of these scriptural homicide narratives generically to read them closely in order to generate a composite understanding of all their common legal rubrics and also their rhetorical and narrative strategies. That is the effort I undertook at Antwerp. At the end of that study, I mentioned that some of these homicide texts make use of chiasmus, calling for further examination of what the, that fact might tell us. And this is the question I now wish to take up. How might chiastic analysis contribute to our understanding of these homicide texts? 
Following the examples in the handout, <clears throat> I will first identify the presence of chiasmus in homicide laws and homicide narratives. But finding a chiasm is just the beginning. In this conference, several speakers have emphasized the importance of asking, what purpose does a chiasm or other rhetorical device serve in a particular text? And in accord with that observation, my paper asks that very question. Why and for what purposes and effects do these homicide narratives use chiasmus? It is often recognized that the criteria of chiasmus operate differently in prose than in poetry. Might the same be true of how chiasmus operates specifically in various literary genres, in ritual, in lamentation, in exhortation, or in legal texts? In Genesis 9-6, the ABC-CBA structure of the law of homicide given in connection with the covenant that God made with Noah is clear. In his commentary on Genesis, Robert Alter notes, this chiastic arrangement suggests, quote, one, a system of retributive justice. There is, two, an emphatic play on three key words, spills, blood, human, by or on account of human, his blood spilled. And three, formally mirroring the idea of measure for measure. How else might chiasmus be used here? For example, number four, the chiastic doubling of these elements emphatically doubles down on the seriousness of homicide. Five, the chiastic reversal of these elements established that the controlled legal response to a homicide, which the culprit himself caused and perpetrated, should echo precisely and return to the culprit and to no others his spilling of the victim's blood. And six, the chiastic balancing of these elements may also convey the inherently presumptive even-handedness and fairness of punishments that appropriately fit the crime. Indeed, from the earliest depictions of divine justice in Egyptian funerary texts down to the modern portrayal of justice, justice is seen as a scale anciently balancing the heaviness and hardness of a human's heart against the lightness and purity of a feather, or in modern times, the blindfolded justice lets the strengths and weaknesses of the case tilt one way or another. Case two, in Leviticus 24, many scholars have found one of the most famous instances of chiasmus. Like Genesis 9, it too pertains to talionic justice. As you follow in your handout, the Lord speaks to Moses, tells Israel to take the blasphemer out and stone him. You shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, he who curses God shall bear his sin, the stranger the same as he that is born in the land. Then the central talionic block, he that kills a man shall be put to death, kills a beast shall make it good, causes a blemish, so shall it be done. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he has caused a blemish, so shall it be done. As he kills a beast, he shall restore it. And he that kills a man shall be put to death. And then you shall have one manner of law for the stranger, the same as for one of your own country. And Moses spoke to the children of Israel. They brought him forth, stoned him with stones. And the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. While this configuration can be refined somewhat, the consensus is that this chiastic structure here is undeniable. And so we can ask, how is chiasmus useful in this difficult case? Although the case out of which it arose did not involve a homicide, but rather a blasphemous offense against God, the general rule regarding homicide is mentioned in elements E and E prime, which frame that central block of talionic formulas. And as it does in Genesis 9, chiasmus again, but here more fully, serves an emphatic purpose. Quote, the legal principle that lies at the core of this decision, in this case, is emphatically the talionic principle, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, end of quote. As Bernard Jackson has shown, 
ka'asher is a crucial word here. It has a qualitative meaning, just as that he has done, or so in the same way as that it shall be done to him again. This expression appears twice and only twice in this text in G and G prime, and thus the chiastic structure draws qualita the qualitative importance of this legal guideline doubly to attention. And at the same time, the three appearances in H of the quantitative tachat formula at the very center of this uh, structure, a blemish for a blemish, an eye takat eye, a tooth, one tooth, takat, one tooth, are thus chiastically enveloped by the two kahasher appearances, and thus chiasmus communicates for Jackson the juridical unification in G and G prime of these two traditional expressions or legal rubrics. As Levinson also has shown, chiasmus can be used for tying together two legal traditions, and that is what it does here. Not unlike a little bit what Stephen Scott was just telling us in the Genesis account. Additionally, as Willis points out, the comparatively strong use of the intensive infinitive in E shall surely be put to death in that section serves a purpose to propel the reader, to push the reader forward toward the center of the chiasmus, where the case's rationale is explained. And there, of course, modern readers find it unsettling that a person, especially a non-covenant-making <clears throat> resonant alien, should be executed for blaspheming or cursing the God of Israel. But as Willis further argues, the chiastic structure in this juridical narrative <clears throat> places the most ordinary applications of the Talionic principle at the center and then proceeds outward from that principle in steps of, quote, ever-increasing import, end of quote. Thus, chiasma serves <clears throat> a gradational function here a loss of one eye or tooth or broken bone in H is not as severe as being marred, maimed, or rendered ritually defiled in G. And that is not as severe as killing livestock belonging to someone else, which is not as severe as homicide, which in turn is not as severe as blasphemy, which is a point we usually miss, but that is what this case is all about. This escalating chiastic ordering sustains the biblical conclusion biblical law conclusion of Ze'ev Falk that idolatry and other forms of insurrection against God were the most serious of crimes. And thus, as Milgram has argued, the Holiness Code in particular is concerned here that even a resident alien is capable of polluting the Holy Land of Promise by such blasphemy, which is a legal holding, as I said, established in this case. Paul Gector has called chiasmus a closed form. And as this structure brings a sense of legal completion and finality to it, we can see that with this holding, the case is closed. And its chiastic form makes that implicitly clear. The third case, the law of homicide in Numbers chapter 35, we discover yet another case of chiasmus. The entire chapter here is rightly seen as a unit, not only about the laws of homicide, but also about how a slayer may find asylum in a Levitical city of refuge. You have the outline here and in your handout. I won't read through that, but let's consider its particular functions here. Chiasmus is particularly used to contrast and distinguish unprotected killings from those killings that can be protected in a city of refuge. In addition, this entire chapter serves a number of further functions. First, the centering function of chiasmus helps in E to clearly state the essence of this law. The only issue that the assembly in the city of refuge really needs to decide is whether the slayer has or has not acted out of a pre-existing hate or animosity toward the victim by pre-planning or deceptively lying in wait. If he is not, the normal penalty of death 
does not apply to his case. But if the killer has not fled to the city of refuge to establish his innocence and the killer meets him, the avenger is to kill him and to carry out that execution himself, stated in D. This requirement is actually stated twice, to be doubly clear. The meeting must be by happenstance, and the avenger must act alone, and I assume cannot be assisted by a gang on the prowl for a blood feud. One of the natural functions of chiasmus is to give a sense of order. The form of this law aims to enhance and ensure feelings of orderliness, patience, and peace in the aftermath of a killing, as opposed to chaos, haste, revenge, and feuding. And once at the city of refuge, the standards to be applied in a case of avenger versus killer are given in the C sections. The contrastive powers of chiasmus plainly establish on the one hand, the presence of physical implements that presumptively point to the guilt of the killer in C, and on the other hand, the absence of certain hostile states of mind that was ex exculpate the killer in C prime. As Jackson observes, quote, Thus, by the use of a literary device, the draftsman has brought to preserve the has sought to preserve the traditional binary oppositional structure, while at the same time offering a more comprehensive and explicit account of the range of possible situations. End of quote. The synthetic function of chiastic parallelism then brings into play respective roles of the duties to make this system work. To encourage and assure the accused to seek refuge, Numbers 35 promises certain protections from the avenger, but to claim those protections, the suspect must, for his part at the outset of the chapter, be willing to submit to the jurisdiction and judgment of the men of the congregation in the city of refuge, that's B, and at the end, it is added that the members of that assembly, for their part, must undertake the duty of justing, judging righteously according to these stated rules and to protect all exculpated killers, provided they are willing to stay inside the city of refuge until the death of the reigning high priest. With statements of law such as these in mind, we now turn to homicide narratives themselves. I think we can appreciate that few uh, Israelite narrators or Jewish audiences would likely have been unaware of the traditional legal rules and procedures regarding homicide. The powerful effectiveness of chiasmus in these general laws, setting forth the expectations of what should happen in the case of a homicide, would most likely have preconditioned listeners to pick up on the uses of chiasmus in telling stories about homicides and drawing morals from these memorable accounts. It is interesting that certain elements that figure prominently in what we call the law codes do not appear in any of the 23 biblical homicide narratives. For example, the cities of refuge play no role in any of these stories, perhaps because in all of those cases, the slayer is not even remotely entitled to protection in the city of refuge. And whereas the law codes speak only of the objective evidentiary tests and subjective inquiries into the state of mind of the slayer, the narratives focus quite incisively on the blameworthiness of the victim, and in addition, on the consequent operation of the hand of God in bringing about the slaying of the wicked. Now let's consider a few of these narratives. First, Abimelech's killing of 70 of his brothers. As Bogart has seen, the final punctuation of this case is, in verses 56 to 57, a chiasm. In Abimelech's frat fratricide, he killed all but one of his 71 brothers, butchering them upon one stone, and then went on a rampage to make himself king. He eventually died after a woman threw a piece of a broken millstone off a tower and cracked Abimelech's skull. We are not told if she threw the stone awares or unawares, as Numbers 35 might have asked, but neither would one assume that she had killed 
that she had hit the skull of Abimelech squarely on his head. That she had the skill to hit Abimelech squarely on the head, excuse me. Abimelech was then killed at his own request by his shield bearer so that no one could say that he had been killed by a woman. This is, of course, more than just poetic justice, stone for stone. This is a narrative example of the principle of divine retributive justice in which the doer of wickedness suffers in return the same evil he has afflicted on another. God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech back unto him. God's intervention was needed to stop Abimelech's campaign as he, one man, threatened to unravel the entire nation. As a result, no one wonders why the woman who dropped the broken piece of millstone was not accused of homicide. This little five-line chiastic resolution at the end of this episode is characteristic of most clever chiasms. It brings to light a new res realization based on a turnabout following a rhetorical rule of reciprocity. As Robert Harriman has observed, the symmetrical logic of the verbal chiastic figure is mapping out some cosmic order. Even something as mundane as the chiasm, quote, he who fails to prepare prepares to fail, communicates an incontrovertible truth of natural consequences of cosmic proportions. Even terribly unsettling cases such as Abimelech's can be somewhat domesticated by a chiastic res resolution of its discord. In Harriman's words, the chiastic device is obviously intended to please. Witness the neat arrangement, the formal precision, the deft turn, the satisfying resolution of an argument, and other com complex relationships that chiasmus brings to our rhetorical table. A second narrative, the case of Phineas in Numbers 25, has the son of the grandson of Aaron, the high priest, spontaneously taking the law into his own hand to kill Zimri, the son of a Simeonite prince, and his consort, Cosby, the daughter of a Midianite chief. God had commanded the people to abate the apostasy of such relationships and actually to hang the heads of offending people up before the Lord. This short account is broadly structured chiastically. What does chiasmus contribute to this legal narrative? The text centers in D on Phineas's positively preserving the people of Israel, whose condition was in serious difficulty with 24,000 having already died of the plague. By positioning at its center the fact that the plague was ceased, the plague then ceased, the chiastic arrangement recognizes God's ratification of Phineas's exceptional conduct. By framing this central point with particular facts of legal significance, the narrative also justifies Phineas in this extraordinary homicide. The unusual state of emergency clearly faced the entire nation, implicating uh, a rare biblical principle that it is better for one man to perish than for the entire people to be destroyed, although that's not explicitly stated. Phineas acted suddenly and spontaneously, another mitigating legal factor mentioned in the law codes. Phineas had not been lying in wait to entrap uh, Zimri and Cosby, whose guilt was open and conspicuously obvious to all. Moreover, their defiant conduct went consciously contrary to Moses' public command and his explicit warning at the beginning, and in the end, the case concludes with Moses pronouncing a covenant of peace between God and the people, doubly commanding the people to then vex the Midianites. In this homicide case, chiasmus serves as a figure of thought, which is recognized in literary theory as, quote, a powerful engine for organizing, inflecting, and generating ideas. Decisions in hard cases, especially homicides, call for strong articulations that persuade 
and communicate details that might otherwise elude notice. In the short story, well, it's actually th three chapters, but uh, the killing of Gedalia by Ishmael in Jeremiah chapters 40 to 42, we have, broadly speaking, an A-B-B-A chiasm based on the words and actions first of Johanan, who warns uh, Gedalia about Ishmael, but Gedalia ignores this warning, then Ishmael's deeds are recounted in killing Gedalia, and Ishmael starts to flee. Ishmael is about to be captured and killed, yet he will manage to flee to Ammon. Johanan then reappears, rescues people who are about to be killed by uh, Ishmael, and they ask Jeremiah, tell us which way we ought to go and what to do. But to their own detriment, they ignore his prophetic advice, much as Gedalia had ignored Johanan's advice at the beginning. Well, uh, the facts of this case are pretty straightforward, uh, but the scriptures here, I think, are all about life and death situations. Lots of killing goes on here. Uh, not only was uh, Gedalia killed and others who were there in his court, but 70 unsuspecting Jewish pilgrims lost their lives, happening, happening to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, in the same way, many innocent people can be shown as being at risk by their unwillingness to follow the words of Jeremiah. And I think that's kind of the prophetic purpose served by the use of chiasmus here, a connection that we might not otherwise have naturally drawn. A fourth case is the famous slaying of Holofernes by Judith. In the apocryphal, apocryphal book of Judas, Judith, a virtuous and wealthy widow, Judith acted on her own initiative and managed to endear herself to Holofernes, the Assyrian or invading commander who was besieging Jerusalem. The story is actually difficult to situate historically. Tony Craven, whose work has been followed quite widely, uh, has uh, uh, identified and divided this uh, story into two halves, uh, both of which are chiastic. In the first half, so we have here a, a double structure in the story, uh, but in the first half, uh, we again see uh, warnings being given. Uh, Holofernes is warned by Achior in a diplomatic attempt to get him to not continue his attack against Jerusalem, but Holofernes mocks and expels Achior, uh, rejecting, or again, turning his back on warnings that had been amply provided to him. Achior, however, was received into uh, Bethulia, which is the, uh, a, uh, a name used for Jerusalem, or a type of Jerusalem here, and, uh, and so on. But more importantly, in the body of the story, uh, we have the introduction of Judith, her plans to save Israel, uh, centering on her beheading Holofernes, and so on. Let's look more carefully about why uh, or how this, uh, this story uh, is, is functioning chiastically. In the second half, when Judith announces her plan to save Israel, she is first discouraged by the Israelite leaders, but she prays and turns her fate over to God, not knowing how her plan will turn out. She wiles her way into Holofernes' tent, gets him good and drunk, and beheads him with the same sword that he had planned to use in killing the Israelites. Judith and her servant amazingly return to the Israelite camp, carrying the head of Holofernes without being detected. Dramatically, but also legally, this decapitation is the climax of the entire story, as the chiastic structure makes abundantly clear. Now, there are lots of elements in this story, and in all of these stories, that are finally reflected in 
the case that I want to conclude with, which is the slaying of Laban by Nephi in the first book of Nephi. It also is quite a dramatic instance of the use of chiasmus. It is not tight as a short grammatical chiasm, but for present purposes, I've arranged the narrative under the following headings. It begins without the walls, just outside the walls, movement toward Laban's house, seeing the sword, the spirit speaking to Nephi, the phrase delivered into thy hands, a central concern about the problems of perishing, the need for the law and commandments to avoid perishing, a return to delivered into thy hands, into my hands, the spirit being followed, the, the use of the sword, Laban and his treasury as Nephi moves in that direction, and finally to outside the walls. Now, as I myself have said, a person who proposes a chiastic text has a burden of persuasion that the text is to some extent chiastic. Let me mention some of the strengths that I see here in the details of these sections. First, in the A sections, we have clear geographical boundary markers without the walls at the beginning and without the walls at the end. This is not quite an inclusio, but clear enough to operate as a narrative boundary. Second, in the B sections, Nephi goes forth. Lek lekan, lek leka. Maybe this is an intertextual allusion, Gary, to uh, Genesis 12.1. He goes forth first to Laban's house, and then in the end, he will go forth again, using the same phrase, to Laban's treasury. Laban's name is mentioned three times in B, and seven times in B prime. Confusion or mistaken identity also occurs in B and B prime, probably because of the darkness of the night. All this mitigates the intentionality of Nephi's venture, not knowing beforehand what he should do, not having been lying in wait, and so on for Laban. Third, the sword is mentioned in C with focus on its hilt and blade, and in C prime, with its use in connection with the hair and head of Laban. The sword reappears in B prime again, but in a subsidiary chiasm involved with sword and garments in verse 19 and garments sword in verse 21. Fourth, in increasing importance, as in Leviticus 24 was seen, the spirit first speaks to Nephi three times in D and E, and constrains Nephi to kill Laban, twice saying, the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands. This is answered in E and D, where Nephi uses the same key words, which he must have known from Exodus 21, 13. Again, I knew that the Lord had delivered Laban into my hands for this cause that I might obtain the records according to his commandments. And therefore he obeys the voice of the Lord. Fifth, the center begins with the affirmation as we're moving into the more important elements that the Lord slays the wicked as we have seen in the story of Abimelech. In their worldview, Nephi didn't kill Laban, the Lord did in effect. And finally, at the very center, as David Seeley mentioned yesterday, a rhetorical question sometimes comes at the center of a text, and in some Old Testament homicide narratives, we find the killer closely interrogating or cross-examining himself or herself before doing what was needed to be done. Here in the center of this text, we find Nephi first remembering the words of the Lord, promising that his seed would prosper if they kept the commandments, and second, thinking, how can they keep this commandment or these commandments if they don't have the law? And what was the central pivot point or tipping point of the story? That very deliberation. Now, I don't suggest that this is a perfect chiasm, 
Nephi is not slavishly beholding to a chiastic Iron Maiden torture device. The facts come first in this story. But Nephi's storytelling is clearly enhanced by his use of chiasmus. This elaborately narrated story established fundamental norms at the beginning of the Book of Mormon, including such themes as the importance of having and following the written law, of receiving and hearkening to the Spirit of the Lord in all things, and of knowing that the Lord will prepare a way for his people to accomplish the things that he has commanded them to do. But in order to establish those norms memorably and legitimately, the case of the slaying of Nephi and Nephi's miraculous success in obtaining the plates desperately needed to be told as effectively as possible. First Nephi chapter 4 does this in many ways. It has many points in common with, the mo with most of the biblical narratives, some of which we've alluded to. In fact, of eight of the biblical rhetorical strategies identified in biblical homicide accounts, Nephi uses seven of them, chiasmus being one of them. So consider these effects of why Nephi might have chosen to tell his story chiastically here. First, persuasiveness. From what we have seen, chiasmus was in Nephi's culture a familiar and effective way to tell a story. Nephi needed to persuade not only the future readers of his record, but most urgently to convince his family members. No one else was present when Nephi took Laban by the hair of his head. As Judah's story likewise says, she was alone with what she did to Holofernes. And so there were no witnesses in either case. His brothers had no idea what had happened and even thought that Nephi, in Laban's armor, was actually Laban who had just killed Nephi. This meant that Nephi needed to convince a surprised Laman and Lemuel and a stunned Zoram and others that he was telling the truth about what had happened when he was actually alone that night in Jerusalem. Chiasmus would help Nephi tell his story formally, articulately, articulately, persuasively, and dramatically. Second, chiastic ordering serves several purposes. It heightens the climactic turning point. Interestingly, the climax of this story is not the killing of Laban, but Nephi's personal deliberation and resolution that the need to make it possible for his posterity to obey the word of the Lord necessitated this killing. The ordering of the events leading up to and down from and away from that center gives the sense that God was driving the unfolding of these, these events. Here too, point F is less important than E, E less important than D, and so on, to the locational safe point outside the walls of Jerusalem. Speaking of talionic ordering, the fact that Laban's own sword, which is mentioned, those words in C and again in C prime, was used by Nephi, the very sword that Laban had threatened to use against the four sons of Lehi. And think of Judith also using Holofernes' sword. Adds an element of talionic order to this account. The balancing effect of talionic retribution is phenomenologically akin to the balancing of chiasmus. Any killing conspicuously disrupts the normal order but chiasmus here helps to restore world order and bring closure to this case. The chiastic form of that account helps to contain, enclose, and package uh, the toxic elements of the Laban story as an ordered literary unit. Precedents. Nephi's use emphasizes three legal precedents that are drawn together in this case. The phrase from Exodus 21, God delivered him into his hand, appears three times in the story. Second, we have the point that it is better for one to perish than an entire nation to dwindle, as we saw in the Abimelech story and that tradition. And third, the fact that Nephi had not been lying in wait also worked into the schiastic structure. 
and is mentioned in Numbers 35. So you can almost hear Nephi making his case with these points to the assembly of hypothetical judges in a city of refuge, showing that his killing was a protected slaying. And all of these various legal accounts, which come from different legal sources, are unified here through the unifying force of chiasmus. Fifth, we have relevances. How do you decide what is relevant in a particular story? The concept of relevance is malleable. Anything probative or potentially significant can be admitted into evidence as relevant, and this chiastic narrative manages to weave together the facts and the law so carefully that all of these details, including the fact that Laban had been amply warned and ignored that warning, would have been drawn to the attention of his hearers in recognizing the relevance of those points in agreeing with uh, the legal uh, the legal outcome that Nephi's slaying was also one of the protected varieties. We have various functionalities, many of which we've talked about. Uh, and uh, finally, let me conclude with uh, the subconscious effects here that might be at work. Because I think subconsciously, Chiasmus helps to make these stories very memorable. Chiasmus taps into the subconscious, ironically turning around the situation and asking us to receive something that we intuitively might have found contrary to what we had expected. Well, in conclusion, with all of this in mind, I want to return to the point I began with, Chias uh, that is, Homicide is ugly. The Book of Mormon in no way condones homicide. Murder heads all 12 of the Nephite law lists found in the Book of Mormon. And murder is the only crime out of 36 various crimes mentioned that appears on all of these law lists. Nephi, as leader of his people, as prophet and as record keeper, must have been concerned about how to limit and constrain any improper reading of this story. The fact that he used chiasmus on several other occasions tells us that he knew what it was and how it worked, and semiotically what it could communicate. It is plausible, therefore, to conclude that he would have intentionally chosen to use chiasmus as uh, his structurally preferred literary form uh, to best contain the story of the slaying of Laban. Thank you. Okay. A few questions. Were the cities of refuge figurative or real? They were intended to be real, and I believe that at certain points they did operate uh, in, uh, actually. Uh, uh, in the Book of Mormon, of course, we don't have Levites, so we don't hear of cities of refuge there. What does talionic mean? Talion just means eye for eye, uh, back and forth. Uh, so a talionic punishment mirrors or echoes the crime. Sorry, I didn't explain that. With incre in the increasing import, would it seem uh, treating, treating refugees equal under the law is very important, it would seem. Is this unique to Israelite law in comparison to other ancient law codes? Well, refugees or aliens were not all, the aliens in the land were not all refugees. Many of them were resident aliens. Uh, but uh, uh, I think the point is that we have to, under the holiness legislation especially, have one law pertaining to both the Israelites and any non-resident aliens who happened, any resident aliens who happen to be there, is because uh, the Holy Land, the land of promise, must be protected from any defilement. Uh, and those who might defile it 
uh, would need to leave. And in fact, even under the cities of refuge, uh, you must flee to the city of refuge and stay there. Uh, you can't go back out into the land as a normal person, even if you have committed what is considered to be a protected homicide. I think it's significant that Nephi and all of his people are willing to flee from the Holy Land. They leave the Holy Land. And maybe that's one of the reasons that they don't ever consider ever coming back, at least not until, uh, not until the high priest is dead. One last one. Uh, let's see. What is the reference in Numbers that relates to Nephi not lying in wait? It, it's not specifically in Numbers. Uh, well, let's see, are you thinking of Numbers 25 with the Phineas case? Obviously, Phineas did not lie in wait. But in Numbers 35, when it talks about coming presumptuously upon someone, uh, that means that you have presumed or you are planning, pre-planning to do it. The exact lying in, phrase, lying in wait phrase is in Exodus 21, verse 13. Okay, thank you.